The informal meeting of the Commission for Social Development is called to order. Good morning, everybody. Before starting, I would like to kindly request that microphones be muted throughout the meeting, unless you are taking the floor. At the same time, please remember to unmute your microphone before intervening. I apologize in advance if we uh, experience any technical difficulties during the course of the meeting. Participants may select the preferred language to hear the interpretation or choose the none option to hear the original language of the speaker. If you uh, face issues, you may send a private uh, a message to the host. I now invite the Commission to turn to agenda item three entitled follow up to the World Summit for Social Development and the 24th special session of the General Assembly and its uh, sub teams sub items A entitled priority theme inclusive and resilient recovery from COVID-19 for all for sustainable livelihoods, well-being and dignity for all eradicating poverty and hunger in all its forms and dimensions to achieve the 2030 Agenda. And uh, B, entitled Review of Relevant United Nations Plans and Programs of Action pertaining to the situation of social groups to uh, hold the ministerial forum. So those are our topics for today. We're very pleased to have you all with us. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished colleagues and friends, certainly uh, there was an extremely interesting uh, opening session and the high level uh, panel discussion. We're very uh, pleased to see the participation of uh, uh, our uh, speakers and others putting questions, taking into account young people, children and other groups in situations of vulnerability and who must be drivers of change for this new reality we are seeking. So hearing the panelists and asking questions on the priorities and interests of each delegation is uh, what we shall be doing today. It's not a question of just rehearsing our pre-pandemic inequalities. We're talking about a reconstruction, uh, moving to helping all. And for this, we need to start to work for solutions in the multilateral sphere to eradicate poverty and hunger using the already existing mechanisms in the organization. For example, it is imperative to analyze the current challenges from a multidimensional viewpoint. We have the uh, specialized agencies of the United Nations. We have to recall our founding principles, which asserted the need for our interrelation, the interrelation that there has to be between the major agencies of the organization looking at issues in a holistic manner involving experts, but not uh, omitting social aspects. It's important to consider the eradication of hunger and social inclusion. And in the United Nations, this should uh, not just be by means of uh, high officials meetings. There has to be connected work respecting the expertise of each of the agencies. Here, yeah, the resident coordinators, country coordinators, have a very important role to play, cooperating with all relevant agencies to address the needs and forms of cooperation that each country needs. May I emphasize the salient role here of international cooperation, particularly South-South cooperation, as a tool to enable us to share uh, technical tools and uh, knowledge amongst the uh, developing countries. I'm aware of the time constraints, so I should like uh, to uh, commence. I am pleased to welcome you to the Ministerial Forum on Strengthening Multilateralism to deliver well-being and dignity for all by addressing food insecurity and the eradication of poverty, including through the promotion of sustainable food systems. 
As some ministers uh, have informed us that they have time constraints, we will hear the presentations by all panelists in one group. The floor will then be open for comments, observations and questions from delegations, followed by responses from the panelists. I am honored to introduce our distinguished panelists. Her Excellency Dina Bolwate, Vice President and Minister of Development and Social Inclusion of the Republic of Peru. Her Excellency Hanna Sarkinen, Minister of Social Affairs and Health of Finland. His Excellency Sahil Babashev, Minister of Labor and Social Protection of the Population of Azerbaijan. Her Excellency Williameta Saidetar, Minister of Gender, Children and Social Protection of Liberia. Her Excellency Mariam Bint Ali bin Nasser Al Misnad, Minister of Social Affairs and the Family of Qatar. Her Excellency Ariun Zaya Ayus, Minister for Labor and Social Protection of Mongolia. His Excellency Kentaro Yosugi, Parliamentary Vice Minister for Foreign Affairs of Japan. I wish to remind our distinguished panelists to please stick to their allocated time limit of 10 minutes per presentation. I now give the floor to Her Excellency Dina Bolwate, Vice President and Minister of Development and Social Inclusion of the Republic of Peru to make a statement. Uh, the floor is yours, Madam Bolwate. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Madam President of the 60th uh, session of the uh, Commission of Social Development of the United Nations, Maria del Kamenesweb. Madam Minister for Social Affairs and Health of Finland, Hanna Sarkinen. Uh, Madam uh, Minister for Gender, uh, Childhood and Social Protection of Liberia, William Etem Sedita. Madam Minister for uh, Labor and Social Protection uh, of Mongolia, Arun Ayush. Madam Minister of Social Affairs and the Family from Qatar, Mariam Bint Ali bin Nasser Al Misnad. His Excellency Minister for Labor and Social Protection of the popula Population of the Republic of Azerbaijan, Sahel Babayev. Uh, Mr. Uh, Vice Minister for External Relations of uh, Japan and Parliamentarian, Kentaro Isuge. Ladies and gentlemen, representations of uh, delegations of countries, international organizations and civil society, I wish you all a very good day as I listen to you from my dear country, Peru. It is an honor for me to participate in the 60th session of the uh, United Nations Commission uh, for Social and Economic Development. The uh, President of the Republic, Pedro Castillo Terrones, sends you a, a fraternal greeting. The Ministry of Development and Social Inclusion in Peru believes that joint actions amongst countries will enable us to achieve well-being and dignity for all as we seek cooperation and strategic alliances in uh, areas which have such a significance as the social development of our people. Alas, as was indicated in the report of the UN Secretary General, in Peru and in other countries throughout the world, the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic have uh, rendered ever more acute uh, poverty and food security. Existing inequalities have increased, as has the vulnerability of many excluded groups. During the health emergency, the government of Peru decreed complementary measures intended to strengthen our system of vigilance and response to COVID-19 and to reduce its impact on the Peruvian economy. The Ministry of Development and Social Inclusion promoted initiatives such as providing coupons to both people in cities and rural areas, such as Yanape, which in Quichua means helping and facilitating. And we also made a direct transfers to social programs. Again, there were specific time limited measures for areas specific areas such as our action for zero hunger, temporary support to strengthen child development, uh, a support of 
to help production in rural households with this assistance economy and uh, a network of support for high risk uh, older people and those suffering severely from uh, disabilities. Amachai. It is important to indicate that it, from the ministry, as we organized everything, the uh, primary emphasis was on our supply chain for food, combating poverty and structural inequality, strengthening the provision of food, and also looking to consumers to promote uh, uh, habits with positive effects, such as uh, initiating uh, canteens and soup kitchens, where the participation of women who were leaders was extremely important to uh, keep up food security and uh, healthy nutrition. Looking at uh, July 2021, the ministry increased uh, its network uh, to, by the tune of 20%, reaching a total of 8 million users. To ensure efficient management of food security in our country, we trebled the number of food baskets arriving uh, at helping 1.6 million of vulnerable uh, people. And again, with our school meals program, Kuali Wama, in 2021, we were able to help uh, uh, more than 4 million students in more than 64,000 public educational institutes. The work that we have uh, been carrying on uh, under the aegis of the ministry with local governments is of the greatest importance looking at food security. 230 municipalities received training uh, related to managing food services, where 623,000 vulnerable users benefited from 12,121 uh, canteens. And we recorded 2,587 citizens' initiatives, such as uh, our soup kitchens, by means of the uh, system that we have for these, Manchake Peru. This uh, in uh, Quechua means uh, my uh, little uh, saucepan uh, of Peru. In 2022, we uh, managed an increase of 65% in our budget to uh, allocate more to our uh, canteens in this very important sector where we saw the outstanding work of many leading women in our dear country. Peru is fully committed to achieve the SDGs and here the Ministry of Development and Social Inclusion puts multilateralism on a very high footing, participating uh, regularly in the ministerial forum of the, um, this Commission for Social Development in the UN, as well as in the FAO Committee on Food Security, the UN Food and Agriculture Organization. Uh, then we were also uh, participants in the uh, summit for uh, nutrition and growth in Tokyo with the Sun Movement, Scaling Up Nutrition. These are international fora uh, providing considerable help for our uh, food security, insecurity policies. Uh, we, uh, in our ministry, are working to care for all those who are most vulnerable in our country. We recognize that in official ways, uh, uh, assessing poverty, showing how a multilateral approach is crucial for the relationship between generating income, capacity building, and helping people so that nobody be left behind. With the aim of increasing the social protection and resilience of our people, the National Policy for Development and Social Inclusion proposes a multi-sectoral approach for the access to those goods and services that achieve real results, specific results. For example, uh, early development of children, the physical, uh, cognitive and socio-emotional development of our boys and girls and adolescents. We also look to uh, 
capacity building for the in economic inclusion of young people and adults and at the quality of life for older people as well as the environmental conditions of our people so that they can reach basic services and high quality production infrastructure i have to add that social exclusion in peru is uh, major in our rural areas and our policies the policies of the ministry have been implemented in uh, recent years focusing on social protection and generating uh, pro production uh, capacity in these groups however the effects of the pandemic have revealed how critical the situation of uh, people in cities uh, is where there is a high proportion of uh, those where the poverty indices have increased, have leapt up, if we look at previous years, particularly amongst young and uh, adult people. In Peru, as in many countries in Latin America, the rural and uh, city areas are very closely interlinked. And the recognition of this enables us to move towards territorial strategies to govern uh, the situation as we identify areas for cooperation between levels of government and provide a technical assistance where it's necessary in order to address the challenges of these times with the uh, rise in poverty that is of such concern, food insecurity and the uh, ever uh, more lively threats of from global warming. We need to work together, unite our hearts to avoid discrimination at all levels and in all manifestations. We are but one humankind. We have to work for that. Thank you very much. I should like to thank the uh, Vice President and Minister of Development and Social Inclusion of the Republic of Peru. Thank you very much uh, for those words. I now give the floor to Her Excellency Hannah Sarkinen, Minister of Social Affairs and Health of Finland, to make a statement. Thank you, dear Chair, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues and friends. The theme of this session, Eradicating Poverty and Hunger, is at the very heart of our joint commitment to achieve the Agenda 2030. I am pleased to share with you some policies and measures that Finland has put in place in order to address these questions. To counter the impacts of COVID-19, I would like to emphasize the importance of preparedness and resilience in our societies. Preparedness is built during normal times and embedded in permanent structures. In Finland, these structures include strong health systems with comprehensive primary health care and skilled health workforce as a basis. The Nordic welfare model is built upon trust and transparency. In response to the pandemic, a high level commitment to leadership and a whole of, of society approach have been crucial. We believe that investments in health, social protection, skills and gender equality are critical for resilience as well as social stability. The COVID-19 pandemic has underlined the urgency uh, to have comprehensive, agile and sustainable social protection systems. During the pandemic, uh, Finland had to make only a few adjustments to our, so our social protection system. This indicates that the basic principles of our universal system uh, work quite well, pre pre providing flexibility as well as wide coverage. Nevertheless, uh, during the pandemic, we saw the need to strengthen our social security, especially when it comes to small scale entrepreneurs and self-employed persons who were hit very hard by the pandemic and who are sometimes left out in our normal social protection systems. This bring, brings us to ask ourselves 
what can we do in order to strengthen social protection for these people also in normal times? This is something we must look into in our work of renewing social security system carried out by a parliamentary committee in Finland. I want to remind about the uh, uh, theme of the CISOC D in 2020, affordable housing and social protection systems uh, for all to address homelessness. When a person has a roof securely over their head, it is easier to focus on solving other problems. And uh, in COVID-19 crisis, we have really seen what a home means to people. In Finland, uh, our policy of housing first is based on a simple idea to give people permanent housing and uh, the support they need as soon as they become homelessness. We see ending homelessness uh, in a wider context of social protection and universal social and health services. Finland has a tough but very important goal of cutting homelessness uh, in half by 2023 and eradicating it by 2027. Dear friends, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, has made interdependencies clear. This includes our extremely complex food systems. In Finland, we believe that a system approach is needed to address multidimensional issues. Uh, an example is One Health approach, which recognizes how health of human beings is interlinked uh, uh, with uh, animals, planet and in environment. To achieve socially, economically and environmentally sustainable food systems, we need broad multilateral cooperation. This comes back to the major challenge for our future climate change. Finland aims to become the world's first fossil free welfare state uh, and the government has an objective of carbon neutrality in 2035. In line with this target, we have a climate food program to support the transition. Through the program, we want to learn what citizens think about transition to healthy and sustainable diets and how to develop a more sustainable food system, which is also easy to choose. Food insecurity is increased by disasters, conflicts and other crises, as we know. We strongly support the multilateral system in addressing the global challenges. Right to food is a human right. Everyone should have access to safe, healthy and nutritious food. To combat child poverty and malnutrition, I would like to highlight an important social innovation that is nutritious and free school meals. In Finland, free of charge school meals have been provided to children and young people for over 70 years. School meals are essential in improving children's health and well-being, learning opportunities and equality. From our own experience, we can say that su such investments made in human capital and education have a vital role in development. Finland has, in collaboration with France, World Food Programme and others, established the Global School Meals Coalition with the goal that every child has the opportunity to receive a healthy meal every school day by 2030. We invite you all to join this coalition. Dear friends, the development of a Nordic welfare state has greatly facilitated our transformation from an agrarian society to prosperous, knowledge-based society and economy. Finland has a long tr tradition of gender and social equality. We believe that it, it is a good investment to ensure equal opportunities to all. Last year, the Finnish government extended the compulsory education age up to 18 years and made the secondary education completely free of charge. The reform aims to raise the level of education, to bridge learning gaps, to improve equality and to enhance the well-being of children and young people. These are especially important goals in post-COVID world, where pandemic has hit hard young people and created significant learning gaps and deepened the inequalities between families, also in Finland. 
I would like to add the importance of supporting families. Finland is in the process of reforming the family leave system. The reform gives families more flexibility and aims at increasing equality both at home and in working life by dividing the care responsibilities more equally between parents and sexes. The reform also takes uh, into account diverse families. In gender equality, we see it necessary to adopt a twin track strategy. It means both tackling specific issues as well as mainstreaming gender equality across all development goals. I want to highlight sexual and reproductive health and rights, which contribute to the well being of individuals, families, and the whole society. Dear friends, in Finland, we see a sustainable and equitable recovery can benefit uh, from the economy of well-being approach that places the well-being of citizens and the planet at the center of decision making. It is crucial for an inclusive and resilient recovery. As the Secretary General's report states, promoting well-being for all people over their life cycle must be at the core, core of any efforts to reduce poverty and hunger. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias, muchas gracias a la señora Hanna Sarkinen, ministra de Thank you very much, uh, Madam Hanna Sarkinen, the Minister of Social Affairs and Health of Finland, for that presentation. It is now my honor to give the floor to His Excellency Sahil Babajev, Minister of Labor and Social Protection of the Population of Azerbaijan, to make a statement. Minister. Babashev, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, Excellencies, dear colleagues. First of all, I would like to convey my, my sincere gratitude for organizing such an important event and for the opportunity to address you at this esteemed platform. Continuous improvement of the welfare of population is one of the key priorities of Azerbaijan's socioeconomic policy. Significant progress has been made in this direction in the last few years. Consistent steps have been taken to strengthen the social protection of vulnerable groups of population to increase social payments and wages. Over the past three years, three social reform packages were implemented with the annual financial value of 5 billion man at approximately 3 billion US dollars. The social reform package for only this year covers 2.1 million people. As a result of reforms, social payments increased by 65%, the minimum pension by 2.2 times, the average pension by 60%, the minimum wage by 2.3 times, and the annual payroll, payroll more than doubled. All of these have been done in just three years. Significant results have been achieved in the fight against poverty. At present, no one in the country lives below the international poverty line. The reduction of poverty has led to a direct and indirect strengthening of the social protection of vulnerable groups, including the persons with disabilities, the elderly, and the other categories of vulnerable population. Currently, implemented Taj's social assistance program protects low-income population and is also an tool in the fight against poverty. Along with implements, it served as a critical social support for the population during the COVID pandemic in 2020. In 2021, the number of recipients of aid social assistance amounted to 7,000 low-income families or 202,000 I'm very sorry, Chair, but I'm hearing also other, other voices. The average monthly amount of social assistance increased for 17% compared to 2020. Another important instrument of the social protection system 
are social benefits. In 2021, about 4.6% of population of the Republic or 466,000 people received monthly and lump sum social payments. The pension system plays an important role in protecting various categories of the population from the risk of poverty and is one of the most important areas of state social protection policy. The average monthly labor pension increased by 60% over the past three years. The achievement of this increase has led to the elimination of poverty among the population receiving various types of pensions. Active Aging Index was developed within a project jointly implemented by the Government of Azerbaijan and the United Nations Population Fund in 2019-21 to assess and measure the active and health aging of older people, which allowed to improve relevant specific areas and develop comprehensive social services. Consistent measures are being taken for the treatment, rehabilitation, and the recreation of the persons with disabilities, as well as for the improvement of legislation in this field. Ladies and gentlemen, in 2020, as a result of the 44-day war, Azerbaijan restored its territorial integrity within the framework of international law and achieved the implementation of four UN resolutions after almost 30 years of occupation of its lands. This war and emphatic refusal of Armenia to release in time all accurate minefield maps for Azerbaijan's formerly occupied territories led to further increase of the number of persons with disabilities, both among civilians and military personnel. During the past year, 48,000 rehabilitation facilities were delivered just to the persons with disabilities. Azerbaijan pays particular attention to the issues such as elimination of informal employment, the adaptation of skills in the labor market, strengthening the social protection of the unemployed and job seekers, ensuring inclusive employment and gender equality. The electronic employment subsystem provides a register of the unemployed, job seekers and employed persons, an automated bank of vacancies across the country, as well as the full automation of employment services. As a result of taking measures, the unemployment rate was declining. However, the COVID-19 pandemic has had a negative impact both on poverty and several other areas. Employment and social security measures were expanded to address these effects. In 2020, employment and social support measures comprising 12 areas in four directions were launched and covered about half of the population or 4.8 million people. In 2021, our country having overcome the shock caused by the pandemic, confidently returned to the path of economic recovery. As a result of comprehensive measures, real GDP increased by 5.6% and the unemployment rate dropped from 7.2% to 6% at the end of 2021. To facilitate and optimize the access of the population to social services, the expanding network of those centers, one-stop shop for social services have been created. The centers provide a total of 156 services in the field of employment, pensions, benefits, social protection. To determine the quality of provided services, the level of citizen satisfaction with the service is regularly assessed. And last year, this level of satisfaction was 98.3%. Also, in order to minimize contacts between citizens and public administrators, and to eliminate bureaucratic obstacles, most of the ministry's services have been transferred to electronic format. Out of 170 services provided in social sphere, 110 have been fully digitized, including 46 proactive services. And by the end of this year, it's planned to, to digitize another 50 services to priority the priority remains the automatization of 90% of the services provided in the social sphere until the end of the year. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you again for your attention and wish you all a constructive dialogue during the forum. Thank you.
Doy las gracias, doy las gracias al Ministro de Trabajo y Protección Social de Azerbaiyán. Muchísimas gracias por su participación y por su declaración. Okay. The uh, Minister of Labor and Social Protection palabra, of the Population of Azerbaiyán. Thank you very much. La excelentísima señora. I now give the floor. One minute, please. Tiene ahora la palabra la excelentísima señora William. I now give the floor to Her Excellency William Eta Saideta, the Minister of Gender, Children and Social Protection of Liberia, to make a statement. We are with. The floor is yours, Madam Saideta. for social development. Um, the Under Secretary General, United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs, co-panelists, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. A special thanks to the chair of the 6th year session of the Commission for Social Development and the Under Secretary General of the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs for the invite. And I'm glad to be sharing this platform with my co-panelists. Mm -hmm. Liberia as a developing nation is challenged. The country faces a series of mm -hmm. endogenous shocks to include declining external assistance, further exacerbated by the impacts of COVID-19. Food insecurity is widespread with an estimated 2.4 million people moderately or severely food insecure as reported in March, 2021 during the conduct of Liberia's food security assessment, 63% of the population are multidimensional poor, with women more affected. 30% of children aged six to 59 months are stunted, and 3% are acutely malnourished. Howbeit, as a country and government determined to make the necessary social and development challenges, we remain cognizant of our own commitments as member states, even with the emergence of COVID-19. Firstly, I would like to share that to address food insecurity and the eradication of poverty in Liberia, especially due to COVID-19, the government has set up several policies and measures to include the holding of a national agricultural fair in February of last year. The fair highlighted Liberia's agricultural productivity and while Outlining the challenges faced by producers and agribusinesses, it presented the abundant opportunities in agriculture and agribusiness. I can proudly share that the number of commercial farms and agribusinesses more than significantly increased from 77 in 2021 to 164 in 2022. While there are now dealerships of agricultural machinery complete with spare parts and workshops. This is a positive development for the efforts to mechanize Liberian farm production. And it's a natural next step of the government of Liberia's own effort through the Ministry of Agriculture to provide tools, equipment, seeds, seedlings to farmers, farming communities and cooperatives. The interventions we made as a government have led to increased acres planted in most crops but especially so for basic foods like rice, cassava, oil palm, and vegetables. As the country moved into harvest season towards the end of the year, bumper crops are reaching rural and urban markets due to the improvements in the logistics and supportive infrastructure that we have provided for agriculture. Dedicated warehouses for cocoa producers are constructed and or rehabilitated in targeted counties, while processing plants for palm oil were also built in targeted counties. Rice processing plants in Lofa County, one of our biggest counties and the one we refer to as our bread basket, were finalized in time to process the massive harvest coming in from expanded farms. We have constructed five additional market buildings and removed several and, and renovated several. To support farmers, 16 million US dollars was allocated through our development partners to our local farmers. I would also like to share that our Ministry of Agriculture 
develop and sign along with the Ministry of Finance and Development Planning, the World Bank's two key projects valued at over 73 million United States dollars. The World Bank's Rural Economy Transformation Project, the RETRAP, which is meant to expand the ongoing smallholder transformation and agribusiness revitalization project, Star P, has been developed for a total value of 55 million US dollars. The RETRAP will oversee Tall Town in a major farm to market ongoing piece of road construction will by next year see the paving of the road going into neighboring Cote d'Ivoire and will facilitate the free movement of goods, passengers and services in sub-region. In addition, this will also drive resources into the rubber, cassava, poultry and pigree sectors, a complement that will help other projects in rice, oil, palm, and vegetables. Madam Chair and all, as a way of expanding the social protection system for all so that no one is left behind through our social safety nets project, we have increased our beneficiary pool to adequately respond to the economic crisis posed by COVID-19. With support from USAID, Foreign Commonwealth Development Office, UK, and the World Bank, in addi an additional 15,000 households benefited in 2021 in urban Montserrado, that is where the capital city is seated. It, this totals 18,307 beneficiaries in three counties, with 82% of the beneficiaries being females and 27% being males. Phase two of the program has been launched to add an additional 6,500 households by the end of March 2022. With support from the World Food Program through the government's COVID-19 household food support program, we provided food assistance to 2.5 million vulnerable persons affected by COVID-19 and preventative measures during our lockdown. This contributed to the reduction of hunger. It may interest you to note that we are shifting now to more focused on establishing the basic building blocks for social protection and an equitable and objective process to the, for the distribution of our limited resources. By this, we have profiled 233,000 households in, the, in five counties. Enrollment continues across the country and we have 15 counties. We have developed the country's gender equality profile, first of its kind in Liberia. It provides an in-depth analysis to enhance the understanding of the differences in the conditions and the needs of our people. Madam Chair, while women and girls living in poverty are more vulnerable to sexual exploitation, including trafficking, moreover, those who experience domestic or intimate partner violence have fewer options to leave violent relationships due to their lack of income and resources. We developed an anti sgbv roadmap in September of 2022 through the instrumentality of our president, and we also are implementing this roadmap. Madam Chair, in closing, I would like to highlight that to address the root causes of poverty and hunger so that a country like Liberia can build back better to achieve social development and the Agenda 2030 all, we need to strengthen existing structures and efforts and increase engagements at all levels. In the case of Liberia, the President, His Excellency Dr. George Manu, we are continuing to exhibit the political will of financial support is needed to, able, to be able to buttress social development programs and investment, as well as implementing policies and other measures to tackle poverty and hunger. To this end, while we strive for more partnership and support, we want to thank the United Nations and partners for all of the support to Liberia geared towards ending poverty and hunger, combating inequalities, and ensuring equal access to basic services to achieve the objectives of the 2030 Agenda. I thank you. Muchas gracias a la Ministra de Género, Infancia y Protección Social de Liberia. I should like to thank the Minister of Gender, Children and Social Protection of Liberia. Muchísimas gracias por su intervención. Thank you very much uh, for your statement. I now give the floor to Her Excellency Mariam Bint Ali bin Nasser Al Misnad, Minister of Social Affairs and the Family of Qatar, to make a statement. Madam Minister, the floor is yours. Madam Chairperson, Excellencies, 
Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to participate with you today in tackling an important issue to my country, Qatar. I would like to thank all previous speakers for the valuable introductions. Undoubtedly, there is a need to promote international cooperation and multilateral partnerships among all stakeholders to achieve a social development objectives, particularly uh, in light of uh, the various challenges and the health crisis that we are facing, adversely affecting our realization of sustainable development objectives, particularly those in relation to poverty and hunger. As you all know, we have played an active role in the global partnership for development and international development is one of the pillars of our foreign policy, particularly economic and social development in low-income countries and countries in conflict or affected by na uh, natural disasters. We are proud of uh, all that we have uh, achieved in cooperation with uh, our bilateral partners and through international organizations. And it gives me pleasure today to review some of our achievements in the field of international cooperation uh, in support of countries affected by the global health crisis, particularly those in conflict and affected by natural disasters, uh, and in dealing with uh, poverty, hunger, and uh, uh, food insecurity. With regard to food security and in view of the adverse effects of desertification, we have launched the initiative of the Global Alliance for Dry Lands, one of uh, the tools that we use in dealing with climate change. And we um, signed a, an agreement uh, with many parties and in view of the United nation's uh, recognition of our important role, we have been given uh, uh, the uh, status of observer in uh, that uh, regard. Uh, as for climate change, we have held an agreement with FAO to assist Som Somalia in dealing with uh, climate change and promoting agriculture and animal production, as well as assisting small businesses, particularly in uh, the field of uh, climate change. We have also established a fund uh, under the United Nations uh, 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 Framework uh, Climate Change Agreement with uh, countries that are adversely affected by climate change, particularly the least developed uh, countries and uh, small island developing states. W uh, in Afghanistan, we have also supported uh, uh, urgent uh, humanitarian assistance and provided more than 70 tons of food stuff and uh, medical assistance. We also um, held an agreement with FAO to provide $90 million to provide uh, food uh, requirements uh, urgently to Yemen due to its crisis. And with regard to our response to the health crisis, we have uh, provided every possible assistance at the bilateral level and through international organizations to provide vaccines and medical stuff. Uh, and we have provided $10 million in the COFAX initiative with a view to providing 1.3 billion doses of vaccine, uh, safe and effective vaccine by the end of 2021 and uh, particularly to 92 um, low-income countries. It gives me pleasure also to uh, mention the agreement with the World Health Organization in 2021 in the amount of $10 million 
to, pro uh, to support uh, the uh, program of work uh, for, uh, for uh, the 13th program of work of the organization to provide assistance in uh, dealing with COVID-19. Madam Chairperson, our excellent partnership with the United Nations have been extremely fruitful and we have established the United Nations House in Doha, which comprises many United Nations offices and agencies that work in the economic and social fields and with a view to preserving international peace and security. In conclusion, we believe that multilateral cooperation is the only means to face global challenges, and we look forward to further partnerships to contribute in building a better future for all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister of Social Affairs and the Family of Qatar. Thank you for your participation and your words. I should now like to introduce the pre-recorded video statement of Her Excellency Arunjana Ayush, Minister for Labour and Social Protection of Mongolia. Seems to be a hitch with the video. So the video from the representative of Mongolia, so we could continue with the following speaker. We now have the pre-recorded video statement of His Excellency Kentaro Ushugi, Parliamentary Vice Minister for Foreign Affairs of Japan. Bueno, seguramente tenemos algún problemita técnico. Vamos, vamos a esperar si eso. We have some technical problems. Si eso se puede we'll try waiting. resolver and see if it's possible to resolve them. Just a few minutes, so please, may I ask your indulgence uh, for a few minutes. Looking at the screen, we have a hundred uh, people wishing to speak. Thank you very much. We have ministers, deputy ministers, uh, both men and women. We have a panel with uh, a high proportion of women uh, participating. I think, as we were saying yesterday in the inaugural session, all countries have really made a major effort to deal with hunger and poverty, and particularly the former during the time of the pandemic. I think that really uh, efforts have been redoubled in all quarters. Let's see if the problems have been resolved so that we can continue, because we've only just got a bit less than an hour for the questions and answers. So let's see if the technical issues of the videos can be cleared up. We have the Minister for Labour and Social Protection of Mongolia with a video, and also the Deputy Parliamentary Minister for Foreign Relations of Japan. We'll see which we can take and then continue.
Bueno, parecería que estamos resolviendo el problema. Estimo entonces. The problems are being resolved. Veremos en el orden previsto. So we shall take the pre-established order and listen to Her Excellency, Madam Arin Susar Schuss, the Minister for Labour and Social Protection from Mongolia. Pediría entonces que hagamos el intento, me parece que era el video de Mongolia porque se escuchaba una voz de una señora. I think efforts are being made regarding the Mongolian video because we did hear a woman's voice, but meanwhile Let's see if we can listen to Mr. Wishushi, a deputy uh, parliamentary minister, minister for foreign affairs of Japan, and then we could come back to Mongolia afterwards. Ambassador, if I may, I hear that there's an audio. Oh, it's working. Perfecto. <laughs> Distinguished delegates. I am honored uh, to present at this ministerial forum on behalf of the government of Mongolia. Uh, stated in the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, everyone is entitled to have healthy and nutritious food. The key framework to exercise these gifts is food uh, security system, which includes uh, food supply, accessibility and security. Social, economic and human development of any country is correlated with sustainability of food security system. The government of Mongolia has uh, approved broad range of laws and policies, including national security concepts, law on food, law on um, ensuring safety of food uh, products, national program on healthy food, healthy Mongolian to ensure uh, food safety and accessibility, as also to improve the nutrition. In um, addition, we have uh, set objectives in long and midterm development policy documents to stabilize food supply and access, improve food nutrition to ensure the safety of raw materials and products at all stages of the food chain. Um, Mongolia has been um, taking substantive uh, monetary and policy measures, such as to provide long-term uh, repo financing on domestic uh, to pro domestic producers, uh, and maintain policy interest rate of central bank to uh, exempt from value-added um, tax to custom tax in order to prevent food shortage. Uh, price rise um, of, of food products and also to mitigate the impact of COVID-19. As a result of the, uh, the measures that, that we have taken, agricultural production has actually increased and some uh, types of products such as wheat, uh, also meat and vegetables have been fully supplied to the population and domestic production of major food products um, has been increased by uh, almost 9% to compared to previous year. However, um, as uh, for landlocked um, country, our market is um, heavily affected by rising food prices at world food markets, as also international freight delays, uh, which resulted the hampered um, and uh, in hampered uh, the supply of um, import dependent uh, products and pushed also the prices up. Um, to address this issue, we have been working hardly to stabilize food supply, uh, supply and also the resource um, to improve the quality of the products. Um, it was very difficult, but yeah, Madam Chair, um, the government of Mongolia has been taking steps uh, to gradually increase social welfare benefits to support poor and vulnerable households, individuals, uh, as also organizations to um, combat, of course, uh, the, the difficulties that we all um, face during the COVID-19, as also, of course, to address the poverty and, and hunger. 
Um, despite the progress, uh, there is still challenges uh, remaining, and we have a, a lack of um, intersectorial coordination to eliminate all types of poverty. We have started to measure multidimensional poverty, um, and um, we are trying to establish criteria to diagnose, um, to have the, um, to analyze and evaluate poverty in the all sectors. Um, National Statistical Office is working to develop National Multidimensional Poverty Index, which is enabling the um, identification of poverty, not only in the uh, traditional monetary sense, but also in other dimensions such as education, living condition, health, um, and so on. So, um, Finally, I would like to express that the government of Mongolia is strongly committed to reduce poverty as also um, and hunger uh, through um, close cooperation and uh, quite big support of international organizations, international donors, and we are very much thank uh, thankful for you all uh, for all the support that we have received during these difficult times of COVID-19 and beyond. I thank you very much. Muchísimas gracias. Muchísimas gracias a la señora Ministro de Trabajo y Protección Social de Mongolia. Thank you very much uh, to the Minister of Labor and Social Protection of Mongolia. And now, I shall give the floor to His Excellency Kentaro Esugi, Parliamentary Vice Minister Foreign Affair for Foreign Affairs of Japan. Let's see if we have luck now, if we're lucky with the video. Thank you, Chair, Excellencies. And my name is Uesugi Ekentaro, and I am a Parliamentary Vice Minister for Foreign Affairs of Japan. It is a great honor for me to be part of this forum. Nutrition is fundamental for well-being and dignity. Many children around the world are suffering from malnutrition due to hunger and poverty. The situation is worsening as the COVID-19 pandemic continues to persist. At the same time, overweight and obesity are becoming global issue. Around 2 billion people worldwide are estimated to be suffering from diabetes and other diet-related diseases. To address these challenges, last December, Japan hosted the Tokyo Nutrition for Growth Summit 2021 and led discussion on five themes. One, health. Two, food. Three, resilience. Four, accountability and five, financing. The summit issued an outcome document, the Tokyo Compact of Global Nutrition for Growth. This document provides direction for the international community to improve nutrition. Furthermore, at the summit, various stakeholders, including governments, announced it more than $27 billion of nutrition-related funding. This includes Japan's assistance of more than $2.8 billion, as announced by Prime Minister Kishida. Along with bilateral food assistance, Japan cooperates with international organizations in providing food rate assistance. For example, through the World Food Program, Japan provides emergency food assistance, school meals, and programs to encourage the development of farmland. Last year, Japan contributed about $226 million to World Food Program projects. Based on the principle of human security, Japan will continue to contribute to strengthen much rights to deliver well-being and dignity for all. We will do so through sharing our knowledge and experience toward the realization of a world where no one's health is left behind. Thank you.
doy las gracias al viceministro parlamentario de I should like to thank the parliamentary vice minister for foreign affairs of Japan. And now we have heard uh, from all our distinguished pan panelists. I shall now open the floor for comments and questions to our distinguished panelists. I would urge you please to put specific questions. You can use the uh, dedicated speaker request form accessible on the chat board within the next three minutes, after which the list will be closed. May I remind delegates that the interactive dialogue serve to post questions and make comments directed at the presenters. The delivery of written statements is strongly discouraged. I would request that interventions be brief and concise and that any questions to the presenter be made at the start. I should like to thank our colleague and the ambassador, the permanent representative of Peru, who will uh, also be with us as well as the uh, vice president. I shall now give the floor to the distinguished representative of Malawi, the first on our list of speakers. A list of speakers for those to make a presentation. Malawi. Thank you very much. Is Malawi able to join us? Yes, yes. Madam Chair, thank you so much for giving me the floor. I have the honor to deliver this statement on behalf of the Malawi Minister of Agriculture, Honorable Robin Clark Lowe, MP, who has not been able to make it to make the statement in person. Your Excellencies, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, this forum is being heard at an opportune time for reflection and formulation of practical measures to address the ravaging impacts of COVID-19 pandemic on all facets of human development. In our context, the pandemic has negatively affected sustainable food systems, which were already grappling with the effects of climate change. It is estimated that in 2021 alone, 161 million people globally experienced the crisis levels of acute food insecurity, an increase of 4% from 2020. As for the SADC region, close to 46 million people were food insecure, owing to challenges like supply chain failures, leading to price increases, pushing several people further into poverty, and comprising their right, compromising their right to food and decent living. Female-headed households in the lowest quartile of the income distribution are the most affected by poverty. The pandemic has further compromised women's capacity to participate in food value chains, both as producers and consumers. The Republic of Malawi's food insecurity situation in 2021-2022 consumption season has improved the recording 37% uh, decrease in food insecure population. In order to consolidate this gain, we facilitated the development of 2021-2022 lean season response plan in order to coordinate the implementation of humanitarian assistance towards the food insecure households. Over and above that, Malawi is also implementing various multi-sectoral interventions for inclusive and resilient recovery from COVID-19 pandemic for sustainable livelihoods, including intensifying COVID-19 vaccination efforts, recruitment of additional head health personnel, promotion of village loan groups, where a major majority of 80% are women, promotion of financial technologies through e-commerce and ensuring gender equality in all sectors. However, our efforts have been compromised by the ravaging um, impact of Cyclone Anna, which impacted Malawi in January 2022, leading to loss of life, planted gardens and food reserves, critical socioeconomic infrastructure, people's livelihoods and retarding years of progress, specifically on SDGs one and two. 
The intensity of the damage and loss reminds us of all of the nexus between climate change, food security, and poverty, requiring a partnership and collaboration at regional and international levels in order to allow for expedited rebuilding and recovery of communities and societies. In conclusion, Madam Chair, COVID-19 has exacerbated the existent um, gaps in the food production and supply chains, denying people of their livelihoods. However, global efforts and strong alliances can potentially enhance resilience through mitigation and preventive measures. Enhanced international cooperation anchored on regional integration is instrumental in securing people's lost livelihoods. I thank you for your attention. Muchísimas gracias, muchísimas gracias a la representante de Malawi. Thank very much indeed to the representative of Malawi for your words. And I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of Portugal. Stefano, are you there? Social policies play a fundamental role in mitigating and overcoming the negative socioeconomic impacts of the pandemic. As countries accelerate in the recovery phases, it is critical to renew our commitment to ensuring equal opportunities and universal protection that foster the economic security of all people. We keep repeating that no one is safe until everyone is safe. Multilateralism plays a critical role in our path towards recovery and in the realization of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Turning to the question, in your views, which opportunities are we still missing in our efforts to strengthen multilateralism, to support efforts to build back better and recovery in a more resilient and inclusive way? I thank you. Muchísimas gracias al distinguido representante de, de Portugal. The distinguished representative of Portugal. We shall proceed as we did yesterday. I shall offer the floor and then the panelists will have an opportunity to respond. Now, the floor goes to the European Union. Thank you very much. Parliamentary Vice Minister for Foreign Affairs of Japan. It is a great honor for for me to be part of this forum. Ahí hay un problema técnico. Fundamental for well -being. Están repitiendo el video. No problem there. We are seeing the video from Japan again. And the uh, European uh, Union representative is uh, ready to make uh, ask the question. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, I would like to uh, start with uh, highlighting that uh, fostering social inclusion, combating poverty and inequality are core values uh, of uh, our European way of life. Uh, we stand uh, firmly behind the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and its uh, Sustainable Development Goals. And today's uh, multilateral uh, co uh, cooperation is more necessary than ever. Uh, to face the global challenges, which uh, we should do in a spirit of solidarity and partnership. And uh, taking this into account, I would like to ask a question on how we can improve our cooperation in a more uh, network and inclusive multilateral system anchored within the United Nations in order to address shared challenges such as poverty and hunger. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias a la representante de la Unión Europea. To the representative of the European Union for that question. And now I give the floor to the representative of Argentina. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Madam President. Thank you. I'm afraid there's a problem with the sound. 
We uh, were delighted to hear from all speakers. And Argentina would like to uh, indicate what we have done during uh, the pandemic uh, to provide food assistance. Our plans worked extremely well uh, to deal with a very complex scenario. There are, I'm, the interpreter has to suspend because of uh, problems with the incoming sound. And uh, for food, uh, the new models of consumption uh, and nutrition, the threat of climate change, these are only just a few of the issues which became more acute during the pandemic and are continuing so to do. We believe that in order to meet the challenges, sustainable food production is obviously part and parcel of a strategy to eradicate uh, hunger and poverty. May I distinguished, uh, the president asked this, the uh, COVID-19 pandemic provides us with an opportunity for rethinking the uh, current models of international cooperation. I would like then to ask the panelists what is the role that they see for international cooperation in uh, moving towards a fairer, inclusive and sustainable form of social development? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to the representative of Argentina uh, for your words and your question. And now we have the last two people inscribed on the speakers list, China and Brazil. Is China ready to uh, ask their question? If not, if China is not ready to speak, we shall move on to Brazil. Brazil, are you able to speak or put your question? Um, madam, I trust you can hear me. Thank you. In 2021, uh, we are having the second year of the pandemic, and Brazil has carried out actions um, to address food insecurity, which was caused especially by social isolation and the lack of productive activities. So as an example, uh, we had the food, distribu food distribution on the amount of almost 2 million baskets of food for over 850,000 families. We also had a priority project called Feed Brazil Program, through which the federal government acquires produce from family farming and allocates them to people in situation of food and nutritional insecurity. So as an example, we had around 107,000 tons of various foods purchased from over 60,000 family farmers. And another last uh, important action that was promoted, it was to try to guarantee access to drinking water for the low income rural population in the country, especially during the pandemic. And the question I'd like to, to do to the panelists is, how has the pandemic impacted food insecurity, and what are the key areas CISOC-D could focus its activities to address the problem? Thank you. Muchísimas gracias a la representante de Brasil. Me gustaría saber si... Representative of Brazil, very warmly. I would like to ask whether we have the representative of China with us virtually. I believe yes. I believe we are now linked to China to enable you to speak or ask your question. Um, President, I'd like to thank ministers for their brilliant remarks. Many of their views are very enlightening. The continued spread of COVID-19 has serious impact on the economic and social development of all countries, especially developing countries. 
about 140 million people around the world have relapsed to poverty due to the pandemic. Unitarianism and protectionism on the rise. Pandemic control and uh, prevention measures disrupt international food industrial chain and supply chain, threatening food security and bring the number of hungry people globally to around 800 million. Facing this grim situation, not only should we have the confidence to overcome the current difficulties together, but also have the resolve to take action. First of all, we should strengthen anti-pandemic cooperation, bridge the immunization gap, abandon vaccine nationalism, regard vaccines as global public goods to ensure their accessibility and affordability in developing countries. Secondly, we should deepen north-south cooperation, narrow the development gap give development prominence in the global macro policy framework. Be mindful of the special needs of developing countries and increase international development assistance. Thirdly, we should advocate green development, bridge the climate divide, and adhere to the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities. Developed countries should effectively provide funding, technology, and capacity building support to developed countries accelerate green low carbon transformation and achieve sustainable development. China has always been a supporter and a practitioner of common development. In September last year, President Xi Jinping put forward the Global Development Initiative at the 17th session of GA, identified eight key areas of cooperation, including poverty reduction, provide a feasible pathway for accelerating the implementation of a 2030 agenda, contributed the Chinese solution for achieving stronger, greener, and healthier global development. We welcome more countries joining this initiative. Strengthen development strategy alignment, deepen development cooperation, and jointly build a community of a shared future for humankind. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you. We have had a few problems with the sound, really. But I think that the main ideas of everybody uh, have come across. And I should like to thank the representative of Japan and the representative of Finland, Peru, Liberia, Mongolia, and Qatar uh, for participating. And now, we shall move to hearing the answers, the responses to the questions put. And here we shall start with the representative of Peru, then Finland, then Liberia. And we also have the minister from Qatar. They are ready to answer. So let's take things in this order then. The floor will go first to the uh, you, Ambassador of uh, Peru to the United Nations. Ambassador, would you like to answer some of the questions? Yes, certainly. I believe that the majority, if indeed not all the questions, uh, really uh, coincide in mentioning two aspects. Vision to wit, the pandemic has led to falling backwards when it comes to combating poverty uh, in that the conditions of food security have worsened in our countries and as a result virtually all states using different strategies and uh, with uh, more or less far-reaching approaches have adopted state uh, action as their strategies. Uh, comments were made about the sustainability of these policies, both nationally and when it comes to international co cooperation. And everything appears to point to the fact that the pandemic it teaches us that the concept of social protection uh, with the uh, connotations of providing some form of uh, con compensation to the poorest, uh, looking at more general uh, development uh, of people is linked to uh, 
the policies in force uh, at present. And this takes us to uh, current economic problems, which have, with the pandemic, to be focused on uh, policies of welfare. So by means of good macroeconomic policies and pointers, emphasis is put on the uh, state uh, of satisfaction of the material needs of families, uh, providing uh, temporary support then by means of social policies, uh, by means of generating employment and uh, 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 adequate pro social protection measures. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. So now we shall give the floor to the Minister for Social Affairs and Health from Finland. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, the question was, uh, what can we do more and what should we do more? And I want to emphasize that the question of eradicating poverty and hunger, uh, it is not a separate issue uh, from economic policies. And a precondition for extensive social protection uh, system is a broad-based, just uh, and effective tax system supported by the people. Uh, in Finland, we have seen that a progressive taxation uh, creates equity and social cohesion in society and ensures the resources for proper uh, social investments, such as education, healthcare, and social support systems. Um, and, um, to the, and also I would like to highlight the concept of the economy of well-being, which is a holistic approach that requires horizontal thinking and cross-sectoral cooperation. Uh, it is about understanding how, uh, for, for example, promoting health and gender equality have vast potential to reduce public expenditure in uh, long term and increase productivity and economic stability. And to the question uh, of how we can pro promote uh, global cooperation uh, to fight poverty and hunger, I think we really need civil, so civil society organizations on board, uh, both uh, domestically and globally, uh, because they can reach the most vulnerable people and they many times have the best knowledge uh, of the situation uh, in the field. And also I believe that sharing best practices between countries is, is very valuable. Um, and about um, the food security and the COVID, um, I would just like to say that in Finland, our way to ensure food security uh, during the pandemic uh, was to strengthen our already quite strong social protection system. So we were using the systems that were already uh, on place in the normal times and we just made some adjustments to them and uh, strengthened them uh, to respond to the pandemic. Thank you. Agradecemos mucho a la ministra de Finlandia, a la ministra de... Minister from Finland, very much, the Minister for uh, Social Affairs and Health. Uh, now I'd like to give the floor to uh, the uh, Minister uh, for Gender and Social Protection from Liberia. Madam, you have the floor. If there's a hitch, we can give the floor to uh, Madam Almisnat, the Minister for Social Affairs and the Family of Qatar, so that we can make best use of time because we don't really have very much left of that. Madam Minister from Qatar, are you uh, with us virtually?
¿no? parecería que no se puede lograr la conexión. It appears that it's not possible to connect uh, either with the minister from Liberia or from with the minister from Qatar. Is that right, Claudia? Is that is that the case? I'm trying to see whether they are available, but technology is always a challenge. So maybe you would like to see whether the deputy minister from Azerbaijan uh -huh. is available. Sí. Sí. La... Yes. Well, we do have Azerbaijan. Uh, do we have Azerbaijan amongst those uh, willing to respond, Claudia? Well, we could uh, read out uh, the questions and you could see which you would like to answer. The first question came from Portugal about multilateralism. How can multilateralism contribute to uh, resolving hunger and poverty in the post-pandemic world? Again, another question was, how can international cooperation play a role after the pandemic? What will be the role for international cooperation in the post-pandemic world? I think that those were the two questions from Peru and also from the uh, minister from Finland. If the minister from Azerbaijan would like to take one of those, or if any other minister in the room. Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, I can take one of those. Yes. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, actually, uh, this question is uh, very timely, and I think this is a good, good platform, actually, to exchange views on this. Uh, regarding Azerbaijan, uh, when we started first uh, considering as a uh, government effort how to address the pandemic issues, and as my minister mentioned, the anti-COVID package was quite uh, considerable. It was about uh, three billion US dollars. But uh, later, when the COVID pandemic effect was continuous and still, which started affecting Azerbaijan since 2020, and we're now in 2022, and still we have effect. And since the first package was just a rapid action to a certain effect of the COVID, now within 2022, we see that we need maybe to continue our efforts. And within that, we try also to bring the best practices and we closely uh, being in touch, not only with the Eastern European CIS region, but also internationally, we try to exchange the views and be in contact with certain uh, specialized agencies of UN and other international organizations to bring to Azerbaijan other uh, social packages that can be on the long term to contribute uh, to this uh, clear problems in Azerbaijan and also which were addressed also in other related regions. So we believe particularly with vaccination and with the social packages, the international cooperation is inevitable and it must be closely followed and we stand by by a commitment of other uh, participants today and, and we sincerely believe that efforts should be continued. Thank you very much. Bueno. to the Minister of Labour and Social Protection from Azerbaijan. Thank you for those answers. I would like to ask whether any other speaker is with us on the virtual platform and whether you'd like to answer any of the questions.
acercamos eh, a, a algún otro de los ponentes en la en la plataforma. We have some of the other speakers on the platform. Would anybody like to uh, respond to Portugal's question about multilateralism and how it can uh, make a contribution to resolving the issues here? I think from New York, from here, in this commission, in ECOSOC, we have to work extremely hard with the other major UN agencies, FAO, uh, IFAD, uh, the uh, W. Uh, uh, World Food Programme and the ILO. So we have to be quite clear uh, looking at the problems, whether we're physically together or virtually together, the directors of these programs, the important officials in the organization uh, can deal with the way in which it is possible to address the problems in a coordinated fashion. I think if we are going to ensure that nobody is left behind, that this issue is not left behind, we have to work very hard indeed, because everybody who has spoken today has indicated how important coordination is, both uh, domestically and internationally. And here, the major role of the United Nations is indeed to promote coordination. We have the representatives uh, of the UN in uh, each of our countries. Each of our countries does have a, co a country representative. And this is a coordinating role. It has to become a true reality. Every single minister, deputy minister who's spoken today or yesterday made this point. I think. Uh, Peru, uh, Ambassador Manuel is, is raising his hand, yes? Are you? Yes, Manuel, please go ahead. Thank you. I just wanted to say a couple of things. I wanted to underscore what the uh, president said about the need for there to be an integrated approach amongst the various UN agencies so that multilateral cooperation can firstly be increased so that there can be a greater sums of money uh, allocated and the results be better. And then uh, there has to be alignment with the social policies of member states. What we have to ensure is that there be no lack of synchronization between the UN programs, the establishment of goals, and the individual social development uh, policies of countries. This means thinking again about a very active dialogue between the agencies of the system, the UN system, and uh, national policies dealing with uh, uh, social cooperation so that domestic objectives are in line, aligned with the major uh, goals. And then also there's the issue of funding. States are allocating vast resources to combat COVID-19. Much is going to uh, social protection programs to avoid or arrest uh, the worsening of poverty and to support family income. This vast level of investment is triggering a new cycle of indebtment, and we have to in avoid this becoming a vicious circle for the majority of countries, particularly developing countries. So I believe that the time has come to think of multilateralism, looking at new financial facilities, with very flexible conditions in order to fund the expenditure necessary for economic and social development relaunching and recovery after the pandemic. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador Manuel Rodríguez Cuadro from Peru. Thank you for your answer there. And I now see that the Minister of Liberia, I think it's Liberia, Finland. Finland. Is it Finland who has her hand up? as a speaker i think i i'm i see that finland would like to add something thank you thank you we're ready for you yes thank you very much madam chair um 
And thank you for the question. Finland is a strong supporter of multilateralism. And uh, so this is a very important question for us. And we see the need to strengthen the UN system uh, also when it comes to funding uh, and political support as well. Um, I think that everybody has seen uh, with the COVID how important it is that we have the strong international um, uh, organizations. And for example, World Health Organization uh, has been in, in a crucial role uh, in the COVID, but also many other UN organizations. And maybe now uh, in, in COVID and after COVID, we might have more understanding for the funding needs of the World Health Organization, but other organizations as well. And this is something uh, that the member states really must uh, look into. And we need to understand that maybe sometimes when we are in investing uh, in, in multilateral systems, maybe we can save money in elsewhere. Um, and um, so we need to do more. Uh, and also, I would like to see that the role of uh, CSOC-D would be also strengthened when it comes to the social uh, questions. Thank you. Bueno, solo tengo palabras de agradecimiento para... Well, all that remains for me to say is a big thank you to all our speakers. And I will say again to Madam Dina Boluarte, the Vice President, Minister for Social Development and Inclusion of the Republic of Peru, Excellency Madam Hannah Sarkinen, the Minister for Social Affairs and Childhood in Finland, His Excellency Sarhil Bajraja, the Minister for Labour and Social Protection of the people of Abbasajan, Madam William Ita Sadita, Minister for Gender, uh, uh, Children and Social Protection in Liberia, uh, Madam uh, Bin Ali Bin Masal Mistat, Minister for Social Affairs and the Family of Qatar. And I should like in particular to thank the Ambassador of Peru to the United Nations for her participation and for being with us, particularly at the time of responding to the questions. Everybody's provided an extremely valuable contribution. This is a very important meeting because we were addressing a core issue and all those who've spoken, all the authorities have shown how hard their countries are working. Their countries which represent regions uh, that bring us together here in the United Nations. So uh, I really am very grateful to all the speakers, uh, to all who participated for your contributions. We're now uh, approaching the time to wind up. But before I do so, I should like to remind you that at uh, 1500 hours this afternoon at 3 p.m., the Commission will commence its general debate on this platform. You will remember that in the general debate, we sometimes have representatives uh, here in the United Nations speaking, but we will also have ministers, uh, vice ministers, directors, uh, representatives of the various ministries. Uh, of those on the Commission for Social Development and the UN system. So, speakers will have to be brief. They'll have to stick to a, a period of about three to five minutes. And we shall be learning of the way in which we can continue to work on this very important task of combating hunger and poverty. For many years now, the United Nations system has been endeavoring to mitigate uh, the situation of those suffering here and put an end indeed uh, to their plight. I would remind you that uh, delegations may uh, inscribe themselves on the list of speakers for this afternoon and the e-delegate platform and the debate will uh, be from 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. We shall have interpretation for two hours until 5 p.m. And we shall be here again 
working in the Commission for Social Development uh, and ECOSOC body. So thank you all very much. We shall meet again at three o'clock this afternoon. Thank you very much. Recording stopped.